Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad you're with us to stay curious today. Beside me is Terry White, of course, the shuttle manager. He is a true lifer of the space shuttle era, and glad to have you here. I'm glad to be here. Well, you've become a great friend of our museum. You've been doing this for over a year now. Marty Winkle, our co-producer over there, is... say hi to us, Marty. Hi, Mark. Hi, Terry. <laughs> Good. How you, uh, Marty and I are in our 480th episodes here uh, in the four years, and uh, Terry, you become a vital part of it. Yesterday, we had Nick Thomas, the astronaut wrangler, on. Tomorrow, we have scheduled Mr. John Tribe, who is a legend of the Apollo era, an expert in hypergolics yes. uh, on that Rockwell Apollo command module. However, we're going to close the museum because of the hurricane rolling in, and we'll have John on Thursday or Friday. We're just in an area where the winds went from being 25 miles an hour to 60, quite possibly in our area. So we don't want people driving around. Probably won't have a lot of visitors. But uh, anyway, that's the way to live in Florida. You, you've been through countless hurricanes, I yep. know. Yep. Uh, and they were since 1965. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what were some of the hurricanes that you remember uh, being the manager of the OPFs and involved with the thermal protection system? Well, well the, the hurricanes that hit us in the in the 2000 time frame and that, where we actually lost panels off of the vehicle assembly building or the vertical assembly building. You know, hundreds of panels came off of that. And I that do was, remember that. That yeah. was the only time they completely evacuated the space center. So, you know, I always had ride-out crews that stayed in my office for all the other hurricanes that would go out. And if anything did penetrate the building, they could go out and, and take care of it uh, to keep the orbiters safe. But uh, for that one, they didn't want any ride-out crew, no one. So they uh, got everybody off the Space Center and closed the gates. Do you remember that, Marty? You were working out there. you remember which one it was? Yeah, I don't know the name of it, but I would certainly remember it. Uh, I worked on the PCCs, the uh, Process Control Center, and we lost part of our roof and outside huh. uh, structure damage. Uh, we were shut down for quite a while. Yeah, the TPSF, where Jeff Andrus worked, they lost their roof, and it shut down our ability here at Kennedy Space Center to make tiles hmm. and blankets and that until they got that back online. Hmm. So, You've all given me something new to ask people, Marty, about, you know, hurricanes, uh, because Jeff Andrus did a tremendous show with us the other day. A lot of knowledge there. Isn't yeah, it? it is. Yeah. It's about as much as you got. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's you one guys, of my uh, checks in the early uh, days. Speak, so speaking of we knowledge, won't. we're going to have fun with Terry. We've got a program all uh, loaded up here to give you, take the skin off of the shuttle. We've got behind us here. What do we have behind us here, Terry? Okay. <clears throat> that shows an orbiter recently returned from flight. And that's the convoy that's behind it. That's the equipment that supplies the air conditioning and breathing air in that, whether you see those orange hoses, to the orbiter, pumping air into the aft, the mid-body, and the crew module for the astronauts and for the spacecraft operators that take over the controls from the pilot and commander. And that then you have the other system that hooks up to the orbiter safing the different systems in there and providing purges for those systems. But this is a later thing after landing. Immediately after landing and the orbiter has come to a stop and everything's secure around it, then we have a special team of individuals that go out there to sample the air to make sure we have no leaks of any hypergalls or ammonia or anything that could potentially injure somebody. They walk around in what we call scape suits. They're self-contained atmospheric suits that they walk around sampling everything. And when they're sure not, there are no leaks that will harm anybody in that, and the orbit is starting to cool down, then they start rolling all this equipment in to hook up to actually maintain the temperatures of the orbiter. We have to keep it nice and cool for the payloads and for the people that are still inside it. Well, and this one, uh, birds particularly landed where? Now it looks like a Dryden landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Okay, we had about a third of the shuttles landed out there. We have to total that up one day. It uh, is approximately a third, so it's always yeah. because of weather. Right. Exactly. Well, except you, in the early days, it was still an experimental vehicle, so the first five landings for Columbia were out at Dryden. So to have the longest, uh, yeah, runway. because as well as a runway, you have hundreds of miles of flat, hard desert to land in, and then the maiden flight of every orbiter landed 
in California. Oh, did they? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. I didn't realize that. All five uh, orbiters landed their first For their maiden, maiden flight. flight. Yes. And what was the thinking behind that? It was just it was a testing of a vehicle that had not flown. Even though we had flown other yeah. tail numbers, we had not flown that particular. I mean, but vehicle. why land out there? Because you have be. here we have only one shot, one runway, one oh, shot. Out okay. there you have multiple flat areas. So if if something's oh, not you, working you. right. You, you know, you have 100 miles to land in instead of two. Hmm. Interesting. Those maiden flights, we'll talk about with Terry, because we had one the month of August, uh, 41D, Discovery's maiden flight. Okay. There that our good friend and birthday boy we're going to talk about here in a minute uh, was on, the Mr. Charlie Walker. So, um, but we're talking, we're going to talk to Terry here. We got our the shuttle garage with you there. Uh, Thank you, Hazel Banks. Talk about knowledge. Gave me this Go for Launch Space Encyclopedia board game. All right. And uh, I kind of, I, I'm going like, wow, I can't wait to show Terry this. Okay. Because uh, it has got on the board OPF1, two, three. Okay. It's a trivia pursuit game. And uh, of course, you know all about it. Yes. <laughs> I think I know something around this space museum, and then all of a sudden I'm going, oh, really? Yeah, well, so what do you know about it? Well, one of my technicians by the name of Pete Nader is the one that came up with the game, got it produced and that, and uh, so it is. He it, it took it to different places here in the, in the county to put it up for sale. I have a couple of autographed copies yeah. of the game for my children at home and that, but it's uh, a bunch of trivia questions they ask you about not just the shuttle program but about the space program so yeah. apollo mercury gemini space spinoffs astronomy yeah. my, my See, he's going to go to all the categories that, that i don't know a lot about <laughs> okay so let's go here mr terry white which shuttle orbiter was first to land at the kennedy space center upon re-entry atlantis challenger or columbia i would say challenger challenger is the first to land at the kennedy space center final answer yes sir Challenger is correct. Uh, that was uh, then give the mission February 11th, probably 1984. February probably, 11th, 1984. Probably STS-7. So that was a happy Valentine's Day for everybody, huh? Yeah. yeah. What was uh, you remember that? I'm sure you probably I, do. Or I, I, I don't recall so exactly. You know, with 135, it's a uh... only fair. I give Marty one, don't you okay. think? Yeah. All right, here you give Marty one. There, I just. Okay, Marty, an, another shuttle. What structure on the mobile launch platform is referred to as the tombstone? Is it the surface of the MLP, the rain birds, or the tail service mast? Tail service mast. You are correct, sir, without even turning it over. That's a good one. All right. Thank you. Yes. Well, good. All right. Well, we may do a couple more of those, but we want to uh, have a couple birthdays here. I'm looking for my, oh, there's, where's my birthday hat? Of all days not to have my birthday hat. Probably got laying over here. Uh, anyway, we've got three fabulous birthdays. Terry, we just wanted to acknowledge uh, Charlie Walker. Charlie become a fast friend of the museum. Wandered in here when we were closed over a year ago doing uh, um, the new rugs. And uh, he uh, does a great talk out there at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, we've enjoyed dinner with him a couple times, and there he is doing what he really loves, talking to kids. Three shuttle launches. Let me get my notes on him there. He is 75 years old today, born August 29th, 1948, in Bedford, Indiana. All right, and there he is with Marty here behind our one-of-a-kind. Those were on the orbiter doors on the last three flights that uh, flight director Mike Leinbach loaned us in the background there. Bedford High School, excuse me, Bedford High School's uh, proud alumni in 1966. He's a Purdue knot, and uh, he's an electrophoresis guy. Charlie is the type of guy like I would have been the guy to go to space. He invented a process that needed to be tested in space to separate things, cells and stuff for pharmaceuticals, and he taught the astronauts how to do it. And they said, we want you to just go up there. The first truly commercial payload specialist does not have an astronaut pin, 
uh, I thought it, I, I thought I ran over his dog when I asked him if it, where's his astronaut pin was. He says I didn't get one. Payload specialists do not. Huh. Mission specialists did. They weren't part of a class. Yeah, they they, they, yeah. they weren't part of an astronaut so, class. But yeah, yeah, and there were multiple ones that flew them to operate different yeah. space telescopes. Yeah, Sam Durant, they were the one that, uh, J.D. Bartow. Yeah, the uh, ones also, that built the uh, telescope. No matter how much he's got twenty days in space, Charlie does. Uh, there I am throwing some rabbit ears on him. He's trying to do that to me. Yeah. But I foxed you there, Charlie. And uh, there he is in our museum here. And uh, just a great guy. Uh, and we'll see him again on Stay Curious. He did a great show with us. This other guy, you said you've had a chance to meet Chris Hadfield. Certainly oh, yes. a, a, a social media mogul. He's got, he debunks space myths on one of his YouTube channels. Um, he's got his own YouTube place and famously sang the song by David Bowie, Space Oddity. Uh, and I watched it today on his birthday. Very good, man. He spent a lot of time floating around singing that thing. Yeah. And then they put it all together here. But uh, uh, good for 64-year-old, the first Canadian to perform a spacewalk, Chris Hadfield. And uh, I'd say that music video of his in space has been seen I think 50, you know, 43 million views. How about that? Yeah. Uh, you have anything to say are about it? People surprised when they hear about how many <clears throat> astronauts are very good musicians. Mm -hmm. You know, they all <clears throat> have a lot of other yeah. He's, attributes besides their, they do. their technical expertise. There's a yeah. whole band, the, the uh, Max Q band mm -hmm. with the... Uh, Bunch of talented musicians and singers. And this is a guy that I bet you don't know much about, because I didn't know much about, but he's 63 years old, Tom Marshburn. And how could you not know much about someone who's been in space for 337 days? Okay. Okay. <laughs> but he was on Expedition 34 or 35 with birthmate Chris Hadfield. Okay. That uh, That's a cool uh, segue there. Uh, we're looking at a man also. How do, how do we not know about T Tom Mashburn? 63 years old today, born in Statesville, North Carolina. I've been to Statesville Stargazing, got some buddies there. And, but he grew up in Atlanta also. He's a physician, all right. And I mean, he was a, an ER physician and uh, board training at Toledo Hospital, St. Vincent, famous hospital up there. Uh, but. Uh, uh, well, the, the, the space station crews don't get the publicity that astronauts do, that what, what launch time or, you know, like a Hubble repair or something uh -huh. like that. They're up there working, and they just don't get the publicity. Exactly. And, you know, it's a different world where it's not hitting the headlines. People are used to it. But 6 year old Tom Mashburn, Marty and uh, Terry, has been on three different spaceships. The Shuttle, Soyuz, and Dragon. He was on Expedition 3. I forgot about that. All right. He's also the oldest person to do a spacewalk at age 61 when he was commander of the ISS last year. Good. So he retired to go to work for uh, Sierra, uh, Sierra Nevada. Nevada. Just, yeah, yeah. That they're just calling themselves the Sierra Corp to train the astronauts that they hope to fly one day on there. So there's three great birthdays born on August 29th, and uh, glad that we wanted to share those with you today. Well, let's get to some uh, knowledge of this gentleman, Terry White. Um, uh, we, 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 I've, I found these. Okay. Terry, uh, let's hold that up there, actually. I found these uh, among okay. things in our collection. You just never know what's going to... Is uh, oversized mm -hmm. sheets. Yeah, Marty's, Marty's got a better, better view, of course. <clears throat> okay. So, yeah. I mean, these are. This is February twenty seventh, nineteen eighty one. Correct. Okay. All right, and uh, the first flight was April of um, uh, six weeks later. Yes. So, so yeah. So what are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at a view looking inside the orbiter, and this one is showing all the different tanks that are in there. There's 25 different commodity tanks inside the orbiter. I mean, it is 100% self-sufficient, so it's got its own fuel, its own oxidizers. It has its own tanks to pressurize the systems. It has its water tanks, even though when it's in orbit, 
the fuel cells produce all the water that the astronaut needs, but you need a hydrogen and oxygen tank to operate those fuel cells. So you need a potable water tank, you need a wastewater tank, you need helium tanks. So there's a multitude of tanks, and on a particular flight, there may be more than that because this picture does not show you what tanks are associated with a payload. Mm -hmm. So, and if we were doing an extended duration orbit, which meant we we're staying up there for an extended period of time with a large crew, then we put a pallet <coughs> called an EDO pallet, extended duration orbit mm -hmm. pallet in the back that had additional hydrogen and oxygen and tanks that you needed to operate the systems over your long flight. Hmm. Well, uh, I love peeling the skin off anything and looking at these schematics of things. Uh, of course, what surprises you maybe is so many things underneath the uh, cabin. And how many of these are redundant? Uh, I see you got left side and right side. That would make sense, I guess, to have a redundancy built in there. Right. Well, and, and some of them are interconnected in that. So, uh, but actually is redundant in your maneuvering systems, which is really important. The forward reactionary control system that was up forward of the windows and that, uh, it's got its own fuel and oxidizer tank and tank to pressurize those systems to, to have them produce the fuel and oxidizer to the thrust, the 16 thrusters up front. Mm -hmm. And then in the back at the base of the vertical, you have your orbit maneuvering system. Again, they have their own fuel and oxidizer. And those are the really hazardous ones. That's the monomethyl hydrazine and the nitrogen tetroxide that are hypergols. And when those come in contact with each other, you have an instant explosion. So you don't need an ignition source, but, but they're totally independent. You have the left side and the right side. And then eventually we did do a cross feed mod that allowed the ability to transfer from one side to the other. But they never completely fill those tanks. They put the amount of fuel and oxidizer in there required for that flight, what they're planning to do with a little bit of extra because everything on this vehicle was about weight. So even mm -hmm. though it weighed as much as a quarter of a million pounds at liftoff for the orbiter and his payload, it still is keep it as light as possible. So you didn't put a bunch of extra fuel in there just to say, oh, well, I might need it. No. It's just if you were taking a car to Orlando, they would give you just enough gas to get to Orlando and get to the place you want to go, hmm. but then no more gas. So Well, that answers a question I've had because you see many 16-day shuttle missions, yes. and several of them were brought back in the 12 to 10 to 12-day frame after a, a two-day uh, uh, weather uh, yeah. uh, stay, saying that the commodities were, were used up. And I always kind of wondered, well, these others stayed up 16 days. But they had the uh, I, extended, I see. Now you answered extended that question. duration pallet in the yeah. back with the additional uh -huh. supplies they needed. So, yes. Uh, uh, very interesting. Of course, I, uh, when you see it like this, uh, I have a better understanding of tragically what was recovered during Columbia. Uh, these are clearly the items that would have survived that re-entry yeah, and, if, and it, hardly anything else. Right? Yeah, and if you can see the, well, the thing that is the strongest is a sphere. You know, we know that because of its shape and that it can withstand a lot more than a square or a rectangle could. But if you look at the picture, and it's a little hard to see, but all the way up front uh, is a number six, and it's pointing down to two different tanks that are inside. Those are the helium tanks to pressurize the fuel and oxidizer in the forward reactionary control system to operate those 16 thrusters. Well, when I was in Texas recovering Columbia, I found one of those helium tanks and it was completely intact. Huh. Other than it was muddy and dirty and part of the Kevlar on the outside was frayed, but that there was no dents or anything in the tank. It had come down through the pine trees, tore off limbs and that, and made a heck of an indentation in the ground where it had impacted that. But we picked it up and carried it out of the woods, and it was 100% uh, huh. intact. They even found some tanks that still had their commodity in them. Wow. So, yep. Very interesting there. Uh, but... Uh, uh, you know, that tragedy that Terry was a big part of also, the whole recovery and so forth. And uh, uh, to revisit that, you know, read the, the good book by Mike Leinbach and yes. uh, uh, bringing Columbia home there with our friend Jonathan Ward. So, uh, And if you're not a reader, it's also out in audio books. Okay. So you can listen to it while you're driving around because my son and I listened to it recently. Just yeah, to go back well, I'll do that again. my next trip then. Good, yeah. good tip on that. Well, we're going to go forward here with looking at the top of this. Again, I found these. Uh, you never know where stuff's going to pop up. 
in our space museum. Where did that one go, Terry? Is that right here? Yeah, there it is. Just okay. to show people that uh, I took this sheet from uh, before the shuttle was orbited, 1981. This is page three. As interestingly up here, we're looking right down on it. The note, all antennas are covered with thermal protective insulation. Uh, no direct access possible. Correct. And, uh, in other words, if we had to access an antenna because there was a problem with the antenna, we'd actually have to debond, remove the tile. If it was the felt reusable surface insulation or the blankets, we would have to cut them off in that to expose the antenna and then remove the mechanical fasteners and disconnect the antenna and take it out of the ship, which in the early days we did a lot. We took out antennas. I was going to say, I wondered how frequent that was. I don't want to early blow the cover was, on. It was very uh, frequent. Yeah. Really? Yeah, so all the antennas, with the Why? exception of the KU the band, antennas they, they would, well, Yeah, when they were running tests, there was an issue with the antennas. So they said, pull it so we can test it in the lab. And then and explain to us what these. antennas these would be for. Okay, these, these would be for the communication and that. So these are S-bands, and just like on other aircraft and that they have tac and uhf antennas for communicating so they have a multitude of antennas and uh when we started flying the ku band the one that deploys out of the payload bay after they open the payload bay doors and that that is the one that to my understanding gave us our best video we didn't have as clear a video downloads mm -hmm. from space until we started flying the ku sure band. That yeah. on here yeah it would come out of that side Yep, it, it cycles out of there and there's a come out of the back. pilot side, wouldn't it? No, on the pilot side. Pilot side. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So, yep. So, yeah. Know, Terry may need to demonstrate some so, of that stuff. But anyway, yeah. looking at the, uh, uh, well, that's interesting. I think the antennas are buried there. Also, uh, the escape system for the shuttles there. Yeah. And in the early days, Columbia was the only one with it, but it did have two ejection seats. And there were areas on the very top, right behind the windows, that, that actually the structure was designed to blow out so the ejection seats could go. But uh, on window number... Thank you, Marty. Number eight up there is still, that is a window that has explosive charges around it that if for some reason the orbiter was in trouble on the runway, the astronauts could blow that window and then uh, they could climb out through the top and the rescue personnel would take them off the top of the... Gee, I can, I can make us see that. They didn't color those windows in there, Terry. Mm -hmm. No. But uh, so that's on the commander's side, huh? Yeah. yeah. Where and, that would be. Yeah. And then... Uh, these two windows right yeah, there. Yeah. Windows yeah. number seven and eight. Uh -huh. Yeah. And those are the ones that uh, have all the camera brackets around them as well. So a lot of the photos you see that the astronauts in the orbiter take while they're in space are taken out of windows seven and eight. Huh. Yeah. Very... They're, they're, yeah. I enjoy the, the detail, you know, uh, just like our everyone watching out there today, and we sure appreciate you watching on YouTube. Um, the the last wheels down was 12 years ago, Terry, and, yeah. and, and you keep it fresh. We love keeping it fresh here at the American Space Museum. We, they've been keeping the Apollo program alive for 50 years, yeah. you know. Uh, but every time we come on here, we learn new things from <coughs> Terry White. Yeah. Well, you don't see the hatch in this picture, but... On the side hatch is window number 11. Now, that is the best optical clarity window out of all 11 windows in that. But I always wondered why they had the window in the side hatch because the astronauts are still in their seats, so they're not at the window looking at us. There is a hat, a window in the hatch. In the dead center of the hatch. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. okay. Yeah. So uh, when the technicians are up there getting ready to open the hatch, the astronauts aren't sitting at the window looking out at them. And when you're in space, if somebody comes knocking on the hatch, you're not going to open it. One, you would lose all your oxygen and your pressure and everything, so you're not going to do that. But if somebody comes knocking in space, you don't want to open it anyway. No, right. <laughs> you wouldn't want a window to look. Who could it be now? Yeah, right? yeah. The song, who could it yep. be now? So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I love how they got the name up there of the orbiter placed up there in this schematic there. But it just gives you an idea. Terry, speak a little bit to the, uh, there's a lot of venting. Marty may circle those for us there. Cargo bay vents. Yeah, I, I advanced up here as we're looking at the whole yeah, side view. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the, but I'm going to zoom in on it. But there's more. Look at all the detail there yeah. as we go forward here to see those vents. Well, well, you have vents in the crew module 
which vent to the outside to equalize the pressure between the, because the crew module is actually a a sphere inside the structure of the orbiter itself. Uh -huh. So to vent that space. Then you have vents to equalize the pressure as you're going up and coming down between the outside and the inside of the payload bay. All right. Those, those small yeah. rectangular. Yes. Yep. Marty, and then there's and then there's more all the way in the in the aft compartment back just forward of the T0 area. Again, these are vent doors that do that. Then you have a multitude of vents for different things. You know, like you have the urine dump nozzle to dump. Everybody's the, favorite. Uh, yeah, the excess water that the orbiter produces when you're in space, they have to dump that in space. So that's the only thing we left in space other than the payloads that we were designed to was the water. And it's so cold out there, it immediately turns to ice and then turns to gas. Well, I'm going to jump ahead. When we're going to show this graphic of all of the things that are coming out of the orbiter on the runway, yes. like the the, uh, the exhaust from the um, fuel cells, yeah. Those, that's exhausting in space, though, too. Well, yes, but the auxiliary power units, they're not using them when they're up in space. They use them when they're getting ready to come home. Oh. Okay, their power when they're in space is produced by the fuel cells. Okay. okay. And they, their byproduct is water. Okay. So, yeah. All right, so the, the uh, uh, APUs are auxiliary power units. That's why they're called auxiliary. Yeah. They're only used for ascent and descent. Yes. Yeah, so because when we're going to see a picture of the venting that some of you have seen uh, in the night shots on a runway, uh, I wondered how what's happening with that in the air well, and that, that, orbit. That's okay. The exhaust. They're burning fuel in when, that. Yeah, so you see the flames coming out of the exhaust. I wonder if that was going on in orbit and it's not. No, it's just as they're getting Either, ready to come back okay. in. Yeah, okay. you'll hear them hear them power up the auxiliary power units. All right. Uh, let's go to the uh, the aft section there. Okay. Okay. The, the aft section you have a multitude in that. Again, I mentioned the vent doors and that. But you have different areas in there to purge different things. And then you have the uh, fuel and oxidizer for the orbiter maneuvering system, that humped area that looks. And if you look to the very right of the picture, you see the big nozzles for the main engines. And you see a small nozzle for the orbiter maneuvering engine. Okay. And then also there's a system of thrusters back there all pointed different directions to maneuver the orbiter when it's in space. And then in the very, what we call the crotch area, which is at the base of the vertical tail, and on the, on the, the spot. Right, the, and, and, the crotch area? Well, it's it's the crotch. It's where the vertical comes down to the ohm spot, so it creates a crotch. All right. I'll look it, at Atlantis yeah. a little different next time I see her out yeah. there. And that's where the exhaust <laughs> for the auxiliary power units are. So a lot of people didn't see it in the daytime. It's just like, you know, a, a dragster or something like that. You yeah, don't see a lot of flame yeah. coming out of it in the daylight, but when it's dark, you see a heck of a flame. So I would, I would get calls that says, well, what's on fire on the orbiter? And I said, nothing's on fire. That's just the exhaust. And that was always on the night landings. People were amazed to see flames shooting out of the orbiter. Uh, let's just go ahead and show you right there. There you go. Yeah. See them? So, yeah. yeah. That's an infrared shot, kind of, I believe, it actually. Is. Yep. Yep. And then there, uh, up above... I, I searched uh, all over to find better pictures because I clearly remember John Zarella there on CNN saying, the shuttle's not on fire, don't worry, that's a normal thing. And it would be associated with this suction noise of, of a, like a whoa, boom, well, yeah, whoa, it's, boom yeah, it's, going on. It was so a like, pumping, I, like I say, uh, if you, you listen, if you I listen, put my something, fist up there because it was so like, like a dragster, all the noise that it is. Yeah, all, yeah, it is like a dragster. So back up one photo. Yeah, uh, let's go Can back. Can you, Marty, back up one photo? Yeah. Okay, look. Yeah. No, no. See that? Now look at how bright the nose cone is. Yes. And, and how the, bright and the, the leading edge of the wings. The rest of the orbiter is cooled down already, but you see those areas that are still really hot i mean that nose cap stays hot for a long time that's the reinforced carbon carbon the tiles cool down relatively quick and we've already got big fans blowing on the well on that through the wheels look yeah, at and the, the 200 well, mile an hour wheels the drag chute's there. still deployed so that is it's coming down the runway so that it is, is just awesome touched down to show you so the that's why the tires are glowing because they're hot from impacting the concrete Okay, uh -huh. yeah, so they're hot. So you, you see the areas that are heated 
are, are above the other levels, but you can see the tile already are not glowing like the reinforced <clears throat> carbon carbon. Now the cockpit's got its own light that's yeah, radiating yeah, there. Yeah. So, or would there be some window? No, there wouldn't any be heat off the windows, would it? No, uh-uh. No. Uh, no. I, I, I don't know. At that point, the glass still may be pretty warm, but uh, yeah, but the tiles are not showing much heat, but the thrusters are showing a little warm there. Again, come the friction heat. Just of a little bit on the OM pod there in the back. But yep, yep. now that nose cone, that is just not a nose cone. It, it, I know that has been hype, highly, I, I've met some people that polished that thing for months it, to make a hyperbola or whatever they, they want yeah, out of it, right? Yeah. It's very expensive piece of hardware. Yes, yeah. and 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 a lot of hand, a lot of manual labor in it. I think. Yes. yes. To get it just the right shape it, that they it, want. It takes a long time to, because it's reinforced carbon. Carbon. It takes months to lay one of those up and manufacture one of those and the leading edge of the wing, the RCC panels yeah. on the wing. It takes months to fabricate one if you need another one. And there you get a good idea of the hole punched in the wing, uh, right? Uh, where the U is with the fuselage yep. and stuff yep. of and Columbia would have been a really hot place. So okay, Marty? looks like Marty's flashing a question. Yeah, at you got a question from Tom Thumb. Uh, he's asking, are the tires specially made? Yes, yes, they are. They're specially made for the orbiter and that, and they were Goodrich to start the program, and then Michelin bought out Goodrich, and as soon as they did, the next set of tires we got were Michelin's. So. Uh, well, ours does say Goodrich. We've got a reject. Uh, no, you've got an earlier one. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Goodrich earlier one. Yeah. And then we've got a, a nose one that was used. Yeah. So Because uh, uh, it's scuffed up. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, because the tires are static when they touch the runway. They're not pre-rotating. So they're touching down a little over 200 miles an hour. And that tire hits a concrete and you get a big scuff mark <clears> on it as it starts to spin. We'll talk about the tires in a minute here, too. But one other question. Did they ever use the tires? They reused the nose tires. They inspected them after flight, and they would use them for a second flight if everything checked out. But the main landing gear tires we replaced after every flight simply because of the stress they saw on touchdown when they came in because the weight of the orbiter and the speed net when they touched down. They, we only ever flew those tires once, and then we put on a new okay. set of tires. And they were fully aired? Uh, uh, well, they were inflated with nitrogen. Right. Yeah, uh, less expansion than that than air, but... Uh, and they are 425 psi. Flown, nope. flown, inflated though. They weren't inflated in orbit or anything. No, like you could not access them in orbit. And in the earlier days, we couldn't even. We well, could a long hose and a could, pump. We couldn't even. Okay, up there in the cabin. <laughs> yeah, couldn't even monitor the tire pressure. So we did a mod so we could monitor the tire pressure because we closed uh -huh. the landing gear doors in the VAB in the earlier days, and then we went to closing them in the orbiter processing facility. So you had the time to go into the VAB for a couple of weeks and then out the pad for a couple of months. And you could monitor the tire pressure, but you could not get access to it without rolling all the way back hmm. to the orbiter processing facility. So, but it changed from heat from cold days to hot days? Well, it did change a little bit in that, but they just wanted to make sure because that you had the right pressure to come all the way back in for landing. It's hard to land on a flat tire on an airplane. Yeah, I hear that. And that was an amazing part of the program, all the all the, the perfect landings. They never really had a close call. Uh, uh, we blew one tire in the history of the program. Is that right? Yeah. Huh. Well, here's, a, here's that schematic uh, of showing you things that are exiting out of the orbiter that's invisible. Yeah. And, uh, and, and some things like monomethylhydrazine. Okay, what's that stuff, Terry? That is the fuel that maneuvers the orbiter when it's in space. It's it's a hypergol, and hypergols are you put the fuel and oxidizer together, you have an incident the explosion. Two liquids and incident yeah, explosion. Yeah, you don't need a a spark. Or two gases yeah, yeah, or whatever. Yeah, and it instantly explodes. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what they use to maneuver in space, and you see the zone of what is predicted for those if it's if anything is leaking out and that and then you see zones for other things that okay here's the ammonia system is down inside the orbiter but if it's leaking it's showing you where the potential is for that leak to be you know it can shift based on winds and that but these are all the hazard zones that you really have to watch for you have to sniff all those zones to make sure everything is good so that's pointing all that out and again it, that doesn't even point out the hazards associated with the landing gear. Those those tires are hot. 
which is increasing the pressure of those tires. So you have to worry about those tires actually exploding. It happens in aircraft. Really? Yes. It so does. we're looking at the orbiter there, and, yes. and, and even though it looks safe, someone's still got an eye that those tires could blow up. Yeah, so we actually started roping them off when we realized the issue with the split rim design of those tires, that it could mm. blow them apart. I've seen aircraft tires, because of heat on a landing, blow and blow apart. Hmm. blow pieces a thousand feet down the runway so oh, that would blow somebody down the runway with it i would think too didn't hit me <laughs> uh there's a bird on the uh actually this is a uh, challenger uh i think it's 51 uh uh i was going to look that up it's one of the early challenger missions there but uh that looks like florida huh it does yeah. there's no mountains in the background so yeah yeah, that might be uh, the the first landing at Challenger. There's no there. fan next to it, so <laughs> right. we only ever landed at white uh, fans once, the, and there was. Uh, so but then again, that beautiful picture of Terry yeah. analyzed a thousand words in one picture here. Yeah. Look at the heat in, in a trail impact there, and now in the back, uh, the belly's pretty hot too. Yeah. Uh, on the back there, uh, you see the flame yeah, the, coming the, the, up the out of the, the top. The sh chute is separated, and we know that wasn't Challenger because Challenger never flew with a drag chute. Correct. Yeah. 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 That was... What was? Here's a trivia question for you. All what right. orbiter was the first one to have a drag chute? Well, Mr. Terry White, I happen to know that the first orbiter to have a drag chute was the maiden flight of Endeavour on STS-49. Good guess. That was the only one built with a drag chute. Atlantis was the first one retrofitted with a drag chute. Oh, you it said was, retrofitted? Well, I said which one was with the first one with a drag chute. It had its drag chute installed here at Kennedy Space Center. Oh, but, okay. but Endeavour was built with the compartment and everything. Which was the first chute. one to land with one? I believe 49. it was. I, I think it's 49. Kathy Thornton even said that at her talk at the Space Center. But, yeah, we'll... Let's check that out. That's a good trivia question. To see, there. a drag chute was one of the fixes the astronauts wanted after Challenger. And since Endeavour was a replacement for Challenger, it was several years after Challenger before it was uh, it was uh, built. What's the significance of the drag chute there? Tell everybody why uh, that, that's such a big deal. Yeah, because that helps, just like in military aircraft, and that, that helps slow the orbiter down. You know, the orbiter's got brakes, but it's very hard on the brakes at the speed and the weight. You know, something that mm -hmm. heavy and landing, like I said, 200 miles an hour, it's very hard on the brakes. So they wanted the drag chute to have the ability to slow it down. I'll now, throw a little. Yeah, Navy pilots in. didn't typically lose use drag chutes because they landed on aircraft carriers and mm -hmm. they had the arresting system to stop those. <laughs> but Air Force pilots landed and deployed a drag chute to slow their fighter jets down. Ah, there you go. That's some good trivia. We have the door of one of those drag chutes that was covered in space. When you watch a film, film, when you watch a video of a shuttle landing, you'll see right before, you'll see the explosion on the back end and the door fly off and bounce down the runway. Yep. We'll show that to you one and day. Then, and then before the drag chute, totally deflates they don't let it sag to catch on the engines while it's still all mushroomed then they release the yeah. drag chute so it falls behind the orbiter instead of tangling on the main engines and they do it, now what do, what forces that drag chute out that big drag chute is just very heavy <coughs> well a pyro a 12 inch mortar fires that drag chute 12 out. inch mortar wow. yeah. fires that drag chute out so it'd be a, it would be a, a cylinder yep a cylinder yep it's okay. packed in there and it, Fires huh. it out. Okay. The door is rectangle, but the cylinder huh. is round. So. Yeah, we'll check that out. And you're looking down on the orbiter this way, uh, looking straight down like that other. This is the impact of all this stuff coming out uh, on the side there. Uh, and uh, particularly, uh, Marty, above the, the exit door, I mean the exit the roof window, you see where they've got that shaded area that's seven feet. Would you highlight that right right there? Uh, yeah, right there. I, I asked Harry, I go, well, what's that? What's exiting from that window, which you said was window number eight? Yeah, that is that is a pyro window. It has explosive charges. That's part of their emergency egress system. If, <laughs> so that's, they need that's to get the out, distance that, 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 yeah, that, that you could get impacted by the stuff, so you have to stay away from that. <laughs> now, 
Fire and Rescue has on the right hand side of the order, they have a panel that they open up and I see a ground yeah. emergency escape yeah. panel. Yeah, uh, and, and they, and they pull a handle the in there that fires and blows that window off. Really? All right, for them to climb up on and get down in case the crew can't blow the window to to get them out. Wow, wow. it's all part of the emergency egress system huh. and that. I'm sure Dave Stangy, one of our top watchers up there in Michigan, is wondering who thought up all this stuff. Well, remember, I mean, nothing. Th this was Rockwell International that designed and built the orbiter and that and they are famous aircraft builders for many many years they built a lot of aircraft so they know about designing escape systems and that but like i said columbia had two uh hmm. ejection seats yeah and once right. we started flying more than two astronauts it wasn't fair to only have sue so they deactivated the seats and then at the first major modification period when we sent it back to california <laughs> they removed the ejection seats well, we've got watching today Cliff Watson in Australia. He's getting into his uh, winter fall down there. Uh, Tom Thumbs watching. Uh, Bill Whiting's up in Michigan. Thank you, Bill, for sending me that info today. Carlton Bailey, CB, they pulled that rocket in. They He was all ready to shoot the last Atlas V rocket out on the pad, yeah. and they pulled it back in because of the hurricane and haven't set a redate for that. Gary Gerald, hope you're doing fine up in Georgia, Peggy Holbert. That's my sister. I was going to say, that sounds familiar to me. Yeah. All right. Hey, Peggy, hope your brother's doing you proud here. We certainly enjoy his stories. Rebecca Vicknar, there's your yep. daughter. daughter. Yep. Yep. And Lane and Riley watching, huh? Yeah. Riley's only like six months old, right? No, Riley just had her third birthday oh, okay. on Saturday. Yeah. Who's yeah. the young one? Well, the, Lane and Riley are the two older ones. Lon Jr. is the youngest oh, one. Oh, that's he, why he's Lon's not, not He's not watching. a year older. Okay. So. Well, we enjoyed Rebecca and your son Travis on here. Just Google uh, the name, their names uh, on uh, our YouTube channel. That was a fun show. Tommy UCX's watching up in... Uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, we know that you're uh, concerned about our situation here, but we'll get through. It's not hitting us head on, this hurricane. Space Monkey's watching. Robert Law's up in Dundee, Scotland. Uh, Connie McDaniel's watching. Hey, Connie. Doug Forrest is in Los Angeles. Dave Stangy, I knew he'd be watching. Lynn Feather is in West Virginia. She, she, she was my admin. Oh, yeah. The OPF, yes. Well, hello, Lynn. Hope you're enjoying your retirement and reliving some memories here with Terry White and Cynthia Rossi. Thank you for supporting and, us. And my so sister is on vacation in England is in Manchester, and she's watching from over there. Oh, good. Yes. Okay. Well, worldwide, we love that. We've really expanded our program to YouTube. Uh, and uh, if I just look good in a tank top... Uh, you know, I might get more watchers out there, but, but I'm doing the best I can, Terry. Yeah, and Travis is keeping an eye on you from Colorado today. Good. Travis White up there. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, everybody that is... And I can't uh, involved. leave out Mom. Patty's, no. Patty's watching from the house. So. All right. Good, good. Getting everything safe for our little event there. A little close-up of the aft end there just to show you a couple of the fixtures that we were talking about in those... Uh, uh, this is serious business, but yeah. also this does translate into today's uh, crewed spaceships. Yes. So, so we we have once it's when it lands, we still have to maintain the temperatures inside the orbiter, and we have to maintain breathing air for the crew that's in there. But it is important as one of our requirements that we have to keep certain temperature ranges from the orbiter. So those red hoses you see over uh, my shoulder right there are supplying the breathing air and air conditioning to the aft compartment one hose to the mid body or the payload bay area and then the third hose to the crew module and that is piped mm. through the orbiter to those different areas of that and then on the other side uh, way up above the engine that you see the long arm from that truck that's supporting different hoses that are connected to different purges in the orbiter so all that has to be hooked up before we start towing the orbiter back to the orbiter processing facility and that stays hooked up until we get the orbiter in position in the orbiter processing facility and, and get it to where we can connect it up to facility systems and uh yeah quite a lot goes on there what uh marty's got a question there we have a question from carlton bailey how worried were they 
when the shoot door blew at launch on the SCS-95. Ironic that it was a John Glenn launch after what happened on his Mercury launch. I, I still don't understand that the drag shoot door blew on STS-95. That's what like the launch. The drag shoot door came off. Oh, at, okay. at the launch pad. They found her on the launch pad. Okay. You didn't find her on the launch pad on 95. No. And uh, he's tying that into the anomaly of worrying about John Glenn's heat shield being. Yeah. Well, uh, no. Uh, that, his the, the, the area where the drag shoot is is relatively cool. Yeah. When you look at because the angle that the orbiter comes back in and the drag chute is deployed right at the base of the vertical. So all of this area gets hot. This area up here is relatively cool. That's why the thermal protection system on those parts uh, is only designed to withstand up to 1,200 degrees or in some areas up to 700 degrees. So it's a relatively cool area. So without the door on there, and then we've never seen temperature issues on the door itself. So, mm. yeah. But uh, you can't know everything. Surprised you didn't know that. I can't so. recall everything, and I don't recall them yeah. saying the drag chute door hit the <clears throat> hit the pad. So, uh, what was your role being out there? Whether you were at Kennedy Space Center or did you go out also to California? Yeah, for, I went to uh, California. Served various roles out there, but mostly it was analyzing the thermal protection system because we always wanted to look at the orbiter that had just landed because we had other orbiters that were soon to launch and we needed to know right off the bat if there was any issues associated with the thermal protection system hmm. that may impact the next launch so that was you know, the first the, report all, that crossed everybody's desk yeah, so we TPS. did five major inspections on the orbiter after every flight and one of them was what we call the quick look at the runway so we walked around and looked at any major impacts or anything that looked, you know, that, hey, we really need to investigate this real close. Then once we got in the orbiter processing facility, then we did a detailed look of look inspecting every tile, every blanket, and looking down in the gaps between all almost 25,000 tiles. So, Well, we will do a show on that one day, just sort of how that worked and look at some of the damage and how you uh, uh, handled it. I understand when I look up at beautiful Atlantis, uh, at this uh, over here at Kenny Space Center, that the 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 black or darker tiles are the replaced ones. Yes, yeah, you can there. tell by the sh shade of the black of the how many flights they have, and if you can get up close and personal to them, I can tell you how many flights on each particular tile. Really? Yeah. Okay, because the numbers on there. You well, know how to read the code? No, the number doesn't tell just by the color of them. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so they do change with color. That's yes, why they get grayer and grayer. Yeah, and that's grayer. why you look some that look nice and shiny, pristine black. They've only got one or two flights on them, and all those ones that look gray uh -huh. have flown all thirty-three flights. They've never been replaced. Serious, all yeah, right. They were built to fly a hundred flights. Well, one day I hope we can do a live show or recorded show out under Atlantis with you. One day we're going to effort that as we learn more things on there. So uh, you want to go out by giving me a question? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Do you want shuttle or do you want any program? So, well, let's just stick to the shuttle there. Okay. I don't want. Uh, uh, I like your shirt. He's got the right. Alpha and the Omega on today. Okay. okay. How long are the space shuttle main engines used during launch? In other words, how long do they run? Two point five minutes, eight minutes, or twelve minutes? Eight minutes. You are correct, young man. <laughs> well, it was too long. I thought it was nine, though, Marty. Well, Mark may be correct, but the card is wrong. Yeah, it's the card is bit... it's eight and a half minutes. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was closer to nine, Marty's told me on there. So, yeah. good. Well, we have some fun with that. Uh, we're going to have fun with uh, this go for launch there. Uh, who again? Uh, Pete the... Nader. Pete Nader. Yeah. Is he around town? Yeah, he's, he's still working on the Space Center last time I talked to him. So, yeah. yeah. See if, we'll see if we can effort him. That'd be a fun little program to talk he about. He might want to come on the show and talk to you. I mean, that's what I'm talking about yeah. there. That's right. So, buddy, thank you so much. Like sure. I said, it means so much how you've uh, embraced our museum. Uh, every time you come here, we're always happy to see you. But tell people out there about what you perceive if we're doing a good job or not. This, this museum is doing an excellent job. I mean, these two gentlemen and the staff that support them in doing the show are doing a phenomenal job. But the museum is unique. It's nice. It's personable. It's up close. And so everybody that I refer to come here says, you know what? I enjoyed the Space Center when they did the 
the thing out there visiting Atlantis and that, they said, but that American Space Museum is a great place to come. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Terry. That's why I why I moved here for it. It felt like the the coolest uh, space cave I ever been in, mm -hmm. and uh, and you really get uh, hooked on our one of a kind memorabilia here. So, Marty, we have a good Streamlabs show today, and uh, anything else over there on your end? No, just getting a few comments as far as uh, how much Terry's appreciated. Well, don't let him see those. <laughs> okay. They also think he's knowledgeable. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm more than just another pretty face. That's right. That's <laughs> right. So, no, we appreciate everybody on here. And like I said, we're going to be closed tomorrow, Wednesday, because of the hurricane uh, roaring through our peninsula here. We had John Tribe scheduled. I'm going to push him back to Thursday or Friday. Uh, John Tribe, you know, a legend in the Apollo era, uh, hypergolics expert on the command module had uh, headsets on at the fatal fire and uh you know uh, he he'll, he'll talk some about that yes. and and uh but uh tr a british guy one of the brits that came over here uh, purposely to help america go to the moon in the 60s so and just John just Trott. a great individual him yeah. and his family so yeah yeah good all right buddy well we appreciate everybody for enjoying the show please tell everybody if you enjoyed it if you didn't don't tell anyone. <laughs> All right. But until next time, I'm Mark Marquette on behalf of Terry White saying we appreciate you watching Stay Curious and we can't wait to see you again to bridge the space between us. Thank you. <laughs>